Hey, yo! Welcome everyone to episode 38 today in the scene. I'm Joe with Indie Arcade Wave, and this week we're going to be speaking about a new indie that's coming out on Steam in a few months. Um, I'm here with one of the creators, uh, Martin Yern. Um, he is a developer out of Sweden, and they worked on a game that feels a lot like uh, Mars Lander, and it has a, a really cool space uh, propulsion control system. Um, how are you doing today, Martin? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. And you? Oh yeah, I'm I'm great. It's a a beautiful cold winter day in Minnesota, so <laughs> I'm I'm loving it. Um, yeah, I want to just remind everybody that's listening if you enjoy what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave to subscribe, like, and share. It means a lot to us, and it really helps us grow as a community. So let's talk about uh, Gravitrex Arcade. Martin, tell me a little bit about yourself and how you got into video game development. Oh boy, video game development, that was a long time ago. Like when I was uh, maybe yeah, a young teenager, I started, I discovered this uh, program on my Amiga that was called Amos. That was like, it was sort of like basic, but with uh, cool functions for uh, making sprites and stuff like that. So it made game development a lot easier. And from there, I've been like teaching myself coding different languages. And and then in, in 2001, I met my friend Onni, who taught me C++, and we made our own game engine. And then we started working on a game that we called Wallbusters, where you shoot like a catapult and you're trying to knock down brick walls and stuff. And then we competed with that game in a Swedish Game Awards competition. And we didn't make it to the finals, but we got an honorary mention for our innovative gameplay from DICE. Uh, and then uh, the next year after that, we didn't participate in the big competition, but we did participate in the warm-up competition, which was like a one-week uh, game jam. And then we made this game, Gravitrex. And we, we won that warm-up with that. And then a year after that, I decided to port the game to Android. And then another few years after that, I was contacted by this guy, Kevin Anderson, in the US, who asked me if he could put my game into an arcade cabinet. And then uh, it sort of went from there. And uh, now, last year, we decided it was time to complete the circle and uh, port the game back to PC again. Gotcha. So you kind of gave us the story of how the game developed. Uh, we know that you're a self-taught coder in multiple languages. Yep. Um, you said that you made the game with someone else. Who was that other person that you made the game with? Uh, her name is Onni. And where, where did this game come from? You said it came from a game jam. Um, did you... I know game jams usually have like a like a background that you're kind of focusing on. What was your your prompt for this? Yeah, so the theme was it, it, the game had to be uh, the the theme was the eighties that you had to stick to, and we decided to make the game on the premise that what if the eighties game developers had access to a modern physics engine, but still limited by the graphics and stuff like that. And so that's how we ended up with Gravitrix. So it's like a Vectrix game, but with a real physics engine that can handle a lot of particles and stuff. Yeah, and the game is super fun and super difficult. It was it was really funny to me as I as I started playing the game, you were kind of trolling me a little bit on Facebook and it was making me <laughs> want to play it even more and more and you're like giving me these little hints like you could do this, you can do that and I ended up getting to, I think, uh, I played again last night, and I think I got to, like, level 11 or 12. Okay. Um, <laughs> finally broke six figures. I know it's probably still a pretty small number, but uh, I was pretty happy about it. Um, kind of walk me through how the development went. Like you said, it's a, a much more complex physics engine than they would have had in the 80s. Um, how did you guys start to piece this game together, and how did you decide that you wanted it to be kind of a, a two-player at all times sort of game? Ooh, you know, this was many years ago now, but if I recall correctly, we just, uh, we, 
<laughs> we always liked uh, playing two-player games, so we knew we wanted to do that. But the problem is, like on a keyboard, it's very hard to make a two-player game that works on a keyboard. And back then, everyone didn't have a controller connected to their PC, you know. So we kind of tried to work with the limitation that we wanted to not have too many buttons per player. So we decided to go with just two buttons plus uh, the grabbers. That's three buttons per player. And we uh, positioned the controls like on each end of the keyboard and try to make it work like that. And uh, yeah. The, the physics part is like, it, it kind of made itself almost because when you have the physics engine, you just, you know, you drop the things in and uh, there isn't too much game rules, if, if, you, if you know what I mean. It's like, the only rule is that you need to land on the platform, right? And then there's the level design, of course, but that the boxes need to be lifted or moved around, you know, that's really all in the physics. Right. And I don't know if you were thinking about this at the time of making the game or if you've looked back and reflected on kind of what the game is similar to, but did you have any games in mind when you got that prompt that you were like, I really want to draw inspiration from this and kind of create this in a more modern sense? Well, I can't remember if we used it for inspiration, but of course it's uh, very similar to the old Lunar Lander and such games. And uh, the the big inspiration, of course, was the console, the Vectrex, on the, the look of the graphics with these lines. But the Vectrex has had like white bluish lines and we decided to go with green lines because we wanted to have the old like monochrome monitor feeling. So we, we made like a mashup of those things. Gotcha. I'm interested, as probably a lot of people that um, follow this community are with the arcade side, um, as someone that works on a game that um, I guess wasn't intended for arcade and then kind of became an arcade game. Um, and now we're working the opposite direction towards Steam. Um, what was it that, like, I know you said you were contacted by somebody in the US. He's down in Phoenix, Arizona. Am I right? Tucson, yeah. Tucson. Okay. Yeah. Because I know. Um, a guy that's down there from Danger Zone, Jordan, and he reached out to me to actually let me know that there's a cabinet and was like, what is this game? So that's how I found you guys. Yeah. What was the, the cabinet building process like? Did you have any involvement in that or was he completely doing that on his own? He did that pretty much completely on his own, actually. And we had an email conversation back and forth with like what I, how I needed to change the game to make it work in his cabinet. And back then it was the original PC version he was using and he was running the cabinet in Linux and uh, the game was Windows so he was using Wine and he had this uh, microcontroller that he had made that like uh, sent keyboard <coughs> keyboard events to the to the game and then uh, like several years after he had finished the cabinet and already had sold it to a couple of places we actually made a major update to the game and we ported it to Unity and uh, made it a lot better, if, if I may say so myself. Yeah, I mean, little development, like you haven't really even talked about all the other things that are in the game. Can you go over um, how the game works and what your abilities are in the game as the ship? Because I think it's a really, really cool control system that you actually control each individual thruster. Like that's a, that's a really unique part of a flying game like this yeah that, that was actually a thing that's been a bit of a little bit back and forth because first we made it like that and then uh, i thought it was more comfortable to think of it like uh, rotating the ship left or right so on the android early android version i actually inverted the controls so that the left input was for firing the right thruster so that the ship would rotate to the left and then uh, after my trip to the US in 2014, when uh, <laughs> when I was going to play the game on the actual arcade cabinet for the first time, I asked uh, Kevin if we, if we could invert the controls because I was so used to them being inverted. And uh, it, it, it couldn't be done in any easy way right then and there. So I, I was simply forced to use the original controls for the we had like a meetup, like meet the developer thing in the arcade place. 
And so then I was forced to relearn the original controls. And then I had like an epiphany, like this is how it's supposed to be, because <laughs> it adds an extra challenge. And it's after when you get used to it, it actually feels right. It's kind of like uh, pilots uh, pulling back on a stick to make the plane go up, right? You, when you're a kid, maybe you think that up should be, for going up, you should pull up on a stick. But really, when you think about it, it's pretty obvious that you should pull back on the stick. And I think this is sort of a similar thing. Right, yeah. Um, and I mean, it's definitely interesting that you kind of went back and forth with the controls and decided to, I guess, I mean, now it's it's not adverted, it's standard controls. Um, but what are the other abilities that you have in the game? So other than just flying, um, you added in some more buttons and more functions. Yeah, so you have the grabber, of course, that is like a grappling hook that you fire out from under your ship that can grab onto things, and you can lift the other ship if it's upside down, or you can lift boxes and stuff like that with it. And we have an auto hover feature where you hold the switch ships button and the ship will auto hover while you're controlling the other ship. It will stay in the air. And uh, what else is there? Yeah, of course, there's a self-destruct button <laughs> that lets you explode your ship if you if you find yourself in a hopeless situation. And if you explode both ships simultaneously, then you will reset the level in case there are some boxes that have gone to places where you can't possibly make the level anymore. And the last button is the mute button on the on the controller is on the uh, X button on the Xbox controller, which is for making the computer voice shut up when he's telling you about all the errors on your ship. Yeah, which uh, when you first start playing, you're going to hear a lot of errors. Um, you're going <laughs> to run into a lot of stuff and you're going to crash a lot. Um, but you get used to it and it's, it's super fun once you do. Um, I guess uh, we've talked about the game plenty. Um, I'm curious about your video game background. I always find it really interesting how developers got into actually playing video games. And some of them um, just kind of stumbled across game development later on in life and were like, this would be kind of cool. And some of them knew from a very young age that they wanted to make video games. Um, what got you started in video games? What are some of your earliest memories? Okay, so when it comes to playing video games, I started out on the Intellivision in the early 80s. And then we got like a C64, and I was playing on that. And then I graduated to an Amiga 500 a few years after that. And uh, already on the C64, there was, in the manual to the computer, there was like uh, uh, instructions for how to use the basic uh, programming language that was included in the computer. And there was this program you could uh, write from the manual. You just you just copied it, and uh, I couldn't even read or write English at that age. So I had my mother do it for me. And then when she had done the whole thing, there was this little balloon that slid across the screen, and I was so amazed that we had just made that just by typing a lot of text into the computer. So I think that's where I caught the bug, if you will. And then it wasn't until later on the Amiga, like I said, when I found this Amos programming uh, environment that I really started making my own little games and prototypes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, you started early. That's that's awesome that you you found that at a young age and really enjoyed it. Um, did did coding and learning more about video games did that help you learn English? Uh, I don't know, maybe. I think, actually, I think more playing the games have taught me a lot of English and uh, and movies, of course. Gotcha. Yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty cool that you, uh, you started off that early. Do you have any memories of arcades back then? Oh, let me tell you, in Sweden, there is almost no arcades at all. It never has been, yeah. But the thing is, when we would go abroad in the summer, we would go like down to Spain or one of those islands that are off the coast of Spain and there on the in the tourist places there would be arcades and so for me the whole the, the, the part of the holiday that was exciting for me was that we were going to go and play arcade games so that's pretty much what I did on my on my summer holidays to to the sunny places 
So what are some of the uh, the games that really stick out in your memories? What really brings back the nostalgic thoughts? Uh, one of the first games I remember was uh, a restaurant that only had one arcade game, and they had uh, Pete the Pack Rat or Pack Rat Pete or something like that. Uh, which uh, they didn't even have the game turned on, I think. We had to go and ask them to, to turn the machine on so we could play on it. It was me and my brother. We were like 10 years old then. And, uh, another memory I have is uh, uh, track and field, where you have to mash the buttons really quickly. And uh, the older boys, <laughs> and this was actually in a hut on the beach. I can't imagine those games survived very long <laughs> with everyone mashing the buttons. And then people would use these tubes that they had around the neck to, that you could put the money in that were watertight so you could swim with them. Uh, and they were like cyl cylinder shaped and they would like swipe them across the buttons back and forth really quickly to, to play the track and field game. And the, they must have totally murdered the machine. <laughs> yeah, those old machines definitely took a beating. Yeah. And then a third game I remember is a boxing game that I actually never managed to find and find out what the name of it was because I, I for the life of me, I can't Google it. It had these big red handles sticking out of it that you held onto with your hands and you could move them up and down and you could push them in and out and you could uh, like swivel the whole top uh, part of the arcade machine to, to duck and weave and uh, what do you call it? Dodge the, the opponent's punches. So it was kind of like punch out, but you were holding on to these two big handles that you would punch into the machine to punch him. And you could like make an uppercut by punching it and pulling it up at the same time. Interesting. And, uh, I don't I don't think I've ever heard of that game. <laughs> like I, I I get what you're talking about, but I can't even like put in a finger on it at all. No, I, I'm, I haven't been able to find it either. <laughs> I don't know. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I guess another thing that I would be curious about, um, we've talked about the classic games that kind of got you started in coding, as well as the arcade games. Are there any indie games that you've been playing, um, probably, I would assume, from Steam, um, that are on your list right now that you think people should give a try? Oh, you caught me off guard here. I'm, I'm going to have to think. Indie games. I don't know, actually. I can't, I, I'm kind of blocking out right now. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I mean, if you want to take a minute to, to think about it, go for it, man. I mean, there's there's so many games that have come out, and I I find it interesting talking to different developers about it because I mean, I keep I keep finding little games here and there, and then bring people on the show, but I can't even imagine what they end up having because I've I've spoke with people from uh, Uruguay and Brazil and Germany, and it's it's just crazy to see what's popular around them. Yeah. Actually, lately I've been in a, in a kind of a nostalgia period, and I've been playing old Amiga games pretty much lately. Yeah, that makes sense. I've been I pulled out my PS2 and I've been playing some uh, some old PS2 games that that really brought me back. Yeah. <laughs> Are there any other games that you have worked on? Um, you said there was one more. Uh, I'm blanking on the name already. Like a catapult game. Yeah, Wallbusters. What what went with that game? Did you guys release that anywhere, or is that still kind of in no, the, the background? Was, it was never released, and uh, I think it has kind of uh, fallen into development hell. And I don't think I don't think it will ever be finished. And I don't even know what the status of the source code is right now. My friend also had a hard drive crash like a year ago, and lost a lot of work that she had already put into that. That's no good. Yeah, no. <laughs> and then we made like uh, one year after we competed with Gravitrex in this warm up competition, there was another warm up competition the following year. And the theme was Vikings in the future. And then we took the model from one of our characters from Wallbusters, was called Warship Longhorn. And he was like kind of like a Viking guy. And we just took that model and made a game with him, which was. Sort of like a beat em up top down where you were swinging the axe on uh, robots, made them fly. And we actually won that year too. So, But we never made anything, any ports or anything of that game. 
have you guys taken i mean you, i know you've said uh you've gone to a lot of game jams have you taken gravitrex to any conventions in sweden or in the area no we have not and we i don't have any like gravitrex cabinet either that i could bring with me so no okay so um i guess to wrap everything up just let us know uh when the game is going to come on to steam as well as any social media links so that people can find you guys uh, the game is coming to steam on march 3rd so that's actually only nine days away uh, and uh Social media, I guess if you go to Facebook, it's uh, Dynamic Entertainment. All right. Well, um, I just want to thank you again, Martin, for coming on to talk about Gravitrex Arcade. Awesome yeah. game that everyone should try and go grab from Steam. Thank you. Um, and if you guys like what we're doing here at Indie Arcade Wave, don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, um, whether you're on YouTube or you're at the podcast. And until next time... Bye.